pot still whiskey. What is it? Well, it's uniquely Irish, but more importantly, it's delicious. Irish pastel whiskey in principle means that a mash is prepared from malted barley and unmalted barley. Uh, that particular mash then produces a wort which is fermented and that wash is traditionally triple distilled in pot stills. So where did pot still whiskey come from? It might well date back to the malt tax of 1682 introduced by the British government as it struggled to tighten its grip on the unruly Kingdom of Ireland. Legend has it the only thing the Irish thought less of than the English were their taxes, so as they could do nothing much about the former, they decided to evade the latter. One of the ways to do that was to make whiskey with just enough unmalted barley to make a point, but not enough to spoil the brew. It would seem then that like many of mankind's greatest inventions, pot still whiskey was something of an accident, but happily one the world embraced. Such was the demand for pot still Irish whiskey that the industry rapidly evolved into a model of Victorian enterprise. Irish distilleries weren't small and rural, they were huge and urban. The Powers Cooperage alone took up more than one acre of inner city Dublin while some 300 men were employed at the John Jemison Distillery. By 1835, there were 93 licensed distilleries in the country, most of them exclusively producing Irish pot still whiskey. And the largest pot still in the world was in operation at the Middleton Distillery with a capacity of 31,500 gallons. It was Irish pot still then, and not Scotch, that turned the world onto whiskey. By the 1830s, the industry here in Ireland was in its prime. But it was about to be struck by a series of devastating blows that started here in Cork with this man, Father Theobald Matthew. For in 1838, he founded the Cork Total Abstinence Society. In that year alone, 20 distilleries closed. At its height, three million people had taken the pledge. Then, of course, there was the famine itself, which decimated the Irish population. One million died, another million fled, leaving behind a broken country. But the spirit of Ireland endured. The smaller, weaker distilleries closed. By the end of the 19th century, only the strong survived. Despite everything, there was still a worldwide demand for quality Irish pot still whiskey. And that whiskey continued to win acclaim both with the public and in competition. By the end of the 19th century, Postal Irish whiskey's hold on the world was so complete that our distilling cousins from Scotland, in the shape of their largest distiller, DCL, opened a plant next to the Phoenix Park, where they promised to make the finest Dublin whiskey. But the world was changing, and the Irish distilleries were so set in their ways, they misread their customers and never saw the biggest threat coming. In 1831, Anias Coffey, former Inspector General of Excise in Ireland, lodged a patent that was to change the whiskey industry forever. The gamekeeper turned poacher. For Coffey, patented a still that produced spirit faster and cheaper than that made in a traditional copper pot still. He offered the still that now bore his name to the big Dublin distillers, but they dismissed him out of hand. As far as they were concerned, what came out of the coffee still wasn't whiskey. They christened it Silent Spirit, and in a book they published in 1878, they derided it as fraudulent and nefarious. But coffee didn't let this get him down. Despite the uh, cold shoulder from his fellow Irishmen, Coffee took his invention to Scotland and their merchants like Tommy Dewar and James Buchanan mixed this silent spirit with pungent Highland malt to create a whole new drink, blended scotch. Let's just say Irish eyes were not smiling. The issue really was that the traditional distillers believed that the introduction of silent spirit or grand whiskey had an effect of reducing the flavour 
of traditional spirits, traditional whiskey, and by that fact, um, I suppose, really destroying the image of what they regarded as whiskey. It took a Royal Commission to decide what was whiskey. In 1909, after 18 months of deliberation, the Commission announced that Silent Spirit was indeed whiskey. The end outcome of that was that the traditional distillers producing Irish Postal Whiskey found it more and more difficult to compete. And really it meant that uh, the uh, more efficient ways of distilling and introducing grade whiskey enabled uh, the introduction of uh, whiskey, which um, was a blended style of whiskey, uh, produced more efficiently, and obviously that began to capture market share. Blended Scotch had got a clean bill of health, but the Dublin distillers were not for turning. They knew that Irish pot still whiskey was a premium product, that they were making the best whiskey in the world. It had just, well, fallen out of fashion. But the Dublin distilleries persevered. They inserted the letter E into the word whiskey to distinguish their superior product from that of their provincial rivals. In other words, they just got on with doing what they'd always done, knowing that one day they would be proved right. Sadly, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were two unrelated historical accidents which together combined to destroy the great commercial preeminence of Irish whiskey. In 1919, Congress passed the Volstead Act, which gave legal force to prohibition. Overnight, the lifeline that kept the Irish industry afloat was cut. Through the Roaring Twenties, bootleggers got rich, trading on the good name of Irish whiskey. And when the bootleggers' dwindling supplies of genuine Irish whiskies were exhausted, some of them didn't hesitate to turn to any old rot-cut liquor they could lay their hands on, and sometimes they gave it Irish-sounding names and Irish-looking labels, pretending it was genuine Irish, because it was Irish that their customers had wanted before Prohibition. The second disaster was all connected with the emergence of Ireland as an independent country. After the eventual establishment of the Irish Free State in 1922, the de Valera government uh, got into a trade war called the Economic War with England and put up tariff barriers against English produce. England responded by putting up tariff barriers against Irish produce. And suddenly, Irish produce, like Irish whiskey, could no longer be sold in the markets of the British Empire. And we tend to forget nowadays that the British Empire represented about 25% of world trade. And that was the time when Scotch whiskey took its first big step into international trade. By the mid 60s, there were just three distilleries left in the Republic of Ireland, and they came together to form Irish distillers. Whiskies we know and love like Jemison, Powers and Paddy became blends, and they put Irish whisky firmly back on the world stage. But it came at a cost. Single pot still whisky almost vanished. We're very, very fortunate that the um, family members who continued the business were very convinced of the uh, correct approach to whiskey distilling. They had the resources, they were family controlled, and they had a belief in their style of whiskey. If the city enterprises, as they then existed, had been taken over perhaps by a multinational in the, say, late uh, 60s, the whole heritage of the Irish whiskey tradition could indeed have been lost. So the Irish industry started back on the long road to recovery. And as is often the case in Ireland, where the past rubs shoulders with the future, a little bit of Ireland's unique spirit stayed with us. And that spirit was, of course, pot still Irish whiskey. And for years, it was the reserve of those in life who liked things to be a little special. Those who know that fashion is passing, but style is eternal. 
So today, not only are we celebrating the past, but heralding a new era for Potstill Irish Whiskey.